There we go. Great. Hey, folks. Um, me and Adam are just going to take an easy one here and just have a bit of a chat, nothing pre-prepared, uh, except for the article you can see in front of you. <laughs> Very little preparation has gone into this. As you can see, I've already messed up the introduction. So, um, right, Adam, we've been talking yeah. a bit about Roman roads recently, and you found a little article, haven't you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, obviously, it's a, it's a topic close to our hearts in the Britain's hidden history sphere. Oh, um, yes. It's a, a notion which is something we've grown up with in Britain, which is this idea that the Romans brought everything here that uh, is is civilised. Um, obviously, I think looking at history and looking at the, the Wilson Blackett stuff in Britain's in history, this is more, I feel it's more to do with um, uh, this kind of 19th century uh, trend of fashioning Britain as an uh, inheritors of an imperial mantle. Um, mm. And it, it, it depends a lot on the the civilization of a of a of a of a savage people basically um and you know what that has come with naturally is a, a suppression of the of the welsh narrative the british narrative of uh, uh you know a, a, an already civilized um peoples coming here and and you know in, in populating the the country way before the romans um mm. and and you know, we're we're starting to see um you know evidence pop up all over the place of of roads which were already here. Um mm. and roads which you know th what this article is about is basically aligning the 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 old narrative put forward by people like Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, about you know these these stories of British kings. Um yeah. we've got we've got Belinus here. Uh, Belinus, you know, three, I think, in the in the fourth century BC, who was known as a a uh, a, a prolific um, um, road road builder. So mm. that you know, and now we've got evidence of the roads which are underneath the Roman roads, which which coincide with that. Which is what this uh, this this article is about. So archaeologists un uncovered the remains of a, of a well-maintained and well-built British road beneath an ancient Roman road in 2011, which I, I'd never heard of, actually. This is the <laughs> first time I've, I've heard yeah. of this. So, And, the, you know, they, the, the evidence contrasts, uh, that, uh, contrasts what modern texts teach about the primitive, primitive pagan peoples inhabiting the land before Caesar uh, conquered it. Mm. So, yeah, we, this, this, um, this article is is pretty pretty thinking along the same lines as us at Britain's in history in that sphere. You know, we we're dealing with this uh, stigma, false false stigma of a of a primitive peoples yeah, incompetent. Mm. Um, so th th it's an ancient road. Uh, this ancient road just south of south of Shrewsbury was cobbled and even engineered with a camber for draining off water. The Daily Mail reported it even has a curb fence system to hold to hold the edge in place. So it's not just gravel road tracks. It's, this no, is no, well thought no, out no. and it's, you know, pretty sophisticated engineering. Um, totally contrary to what you'd see if you walked into a museum in Britain. Um, I think that the town that I live in, in Rochester, um, so Rochester is on the A2 in Britain, which is the old road which goes from Dover um, to London. Um, and it's you know it's a it's a pretty pretty old road, and you, you walk into the to the museum there, and uh, it says the first thing it says when you walk in is that history starts uh, when Julius Caesar you know comes to Britain. This is when history starts, guys. There's no history yeah. before that. <laughs> Don't even look at uh, Jeffrey of Monmouth. Um, no, so no, yeah, no. It, it's 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 a it's a long it's thinking along those lines. Um, Tim uh, Mollim, uh, an archaeologist working on, on the project, told the Daily Mail, the traditional view currently is that the Romans came over to Britain, built the roads and civilised the people. But we have found this road, which was built before the Romans invaded. Mm. Um, fantastic. So, yeah, there, was, there were roads in ancient times. The Romans probably <laughs> probably did an overlay. You know, why yeah. wouldn't you put yeah. an overlay over a road which is which is already there in use and known mm -hmm. about? Um it's what so, we still do today. 
Absolutely. We do it. We do it every six months here, though, because we can't overmatch properly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> six months? We're lucky. Yeah, so it happens every three years in Devon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Always putting new, new something. I've got a road near me where grass grows in the middle of it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> um, the only knowledgeable and civilized people that could have built the roads so well, which means these ancients were not at all primitive in their abilities to build designs like we do today. Um. So yeah. Um. So this 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 article goes on a little bit. To, it goes into the the, uh, the 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 kind of histories that we talk about on this channel in Britain's history, mm. uh, you know, going towards that kind of Geoffrey of Monmouth traditional yeah. kind of narrative yeah. view of history, um, which uh, would tell of, like I mentioned before, King Bolinus, who 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 was prolifically uh, uh, building roads. Um, mm. Have a look. Have a look at this. This just caught my eye. What I said about yeah. the Foss Way, Dave. Okay. So, um, so um, Jeffrey says from the tip of Cornwall, and then in square brackets, Totnes. Ah. Oh. So he he doesn't say it goes to Totnes. He says from the tip of Cornwall. Ah, oh, yeah. They just which would be St Michael's there. Mount, Penzance, you know, lands there. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You know, I you know. I don't know why they chose Totnes, probably because of the archaeological evidence at the time. Yeah. Probably why sure. they put Totnes for that. But yeah, I just thought. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, Jeffrey says Cornwall, so that's interesting. Brilliant. We like that. We like yeah. Jeffrey Von from this show. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, right. The chronicle itself, the recently translated translated from ancient Welsh to English, provides details about these rows, including how their layout is reminiscent of the striped pattern on the British flag. What do you think of that one, Pete? This one here. Yeah. Well, I remember... Um, uh, is it Hugh, Hugh Evans who does the... Oh, yes. He did a thing on the, the British flag about the, the colour system. It's basically like a like a compass i believe he was you know so you had the the um oh god i can't even do it but that's a fantastic little video i, I thought that was very interesting but yeah I, 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 yeah we, we should look into that actually it's yeah very, uh, yeah yeah it's like a like a once and future sort of pattern mm. uh imprinted onto into the landscape somehow and also this idea of um geodesy and and um mapping the landscape is seem to be very important important from ancient cultures in in britain well ancient cultures all over the world but in britain from the from the neolithic period there seems to be this like you know the, the way that certain sites line up we always talk about the michael line um but just um oh god that was amazing adam you should watch um what's he called he does loads of videos on on Brittany and Karnak and the the geometry and the um, the layout of the sites at Karnak, and he's done a he's released um, a set of videos recently lectures on Stonehenge, things about Stonehenge I'd n I'd never heard of before and I'm absolutely amazed I'd not heard of anyone mentioning before as well. Um, What's God, that? right? I'm gonna look right. You continue with that. I'll just try and <laughs> I'll send you a link for that. All right. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah. I'll have a look at that. Um, right. So and 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 so he, Belinus, summoned before him all of the stonemasons of Britain and commanded them to build roads of stone and mortar, according to law. And none, and not and one of these roads ran through such cities as lay in its path from the tip of Cornwall up to Cape Bladden. Caithness. Is that how you say it? Caithness? I think it's Cape Kate Ness. Cape Ness and Albany. Kate. The entire length of Britain and another walk. So you got you also got the um the Bolinus ley line, haven't you? Yeah. Going from, yeah. from South Hall, which we've spoken about before. Um so Bolinus becomes this uh figure in, in the British kind of metaphysic, which is to do with um a spine. 
to do with uh, a, a, a connection from a higher to lower, lower to higher rather. Um, mm. And I've I've got the book somewhere. Gave it to uh, Alex Mapana. It, it, it's uh, it's called the the I think it's called the um, Spine of Albion, and it's it's still it's got all these nodes. Kind of like spiritual hotspots for, under, oh, for, right. for the ascension of uh, if you want to do a sort of pilgrimage up up yeah up through Britain, and which goes up to uh, um some pretty uh, interestingly uh, uh, significant um, sort of megalithic places as well. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like, are they like chakras almost? Places, yeah, like right? that kind yeah. of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. That kind of, yeah. Um, you, you see a lot of people at the moment going to these places and, and sort of offering healing to these different areas of the, of the land, if you will, sort of mm. like a bit of a, 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 a interaction with the land in a healing way. So yeah. in, interesting stuff. That's that's the kind of role Belinus has in in the in, yeah. in Britain, and even even today in sort of sort of some sort of spiritual circles has some kind of significance even today. So it's interesting. Yeah, um, but belly, but Belinus is. Eh. It gets confusing, doesn't it? Because there is obviously historical characters of this name, and also yeah, yeah. a god, a, a pre-Roman god, pre-Roman god. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, I mean I'm sun, trying not to god, use the c it? word. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. I understand. A, yeah, a, Ju- a Jupiter, Zeus sort of thing, but yeah, sun god as well. So really, Apollo. But, but, and I think this is. I try to. I always try to sort of like get this across to people that. When people like to talk about um, mythologizing the British kings, yeah. is that to, partly to do with a a sometimes purposeful confusion between mm. historical characters and their metaphysical counterparts? Yeah, yeah, very um, very uh, central conversation to have. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. and that that confusion could have happened on both sides of the you know because we. You know, it's it's very common for uh, historical people to get mythologized in some way, but also get associated with with certain um, certain other characters and ideas. You know, we talk about the relationship between Arthur stories and and Christ as well. That yeah. th- th- these things sort of develop, and it's 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 not necessarily doesn't fictionalize the the real person. It just just adds another layer of interpretation to the, the yes, metaphysical yeah. aspect. If you ask me, it doesn't it doesn't make the historical side less important. But no, I, I, absolutely, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. Mm. It's uh, it's interesting. It's a good look at um, I guess the psyche of a people, the kind of imagos they want to hang as a, a hook on certain p- figures in history. You know, yes. Yeah. It says a lot about a culture of people, and I think it's all information there to be analysed and had a look at. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's all good. It's it's relevant context. So yeah, um, yeah, good stuff. Uh, so artifacts like well maintained stone roads built prior to Julius Caesar's fifty five BC invasion of Britain and ancient chronicles uh, that plainly state that uh, is exactly what took place. Not to mention the name of modern day Billingsgate matches the King Belinus's chron- chronicled name. I didn't know that. Uh, do not all support secular historians' assertion of an opaque his- history uh, featuring vague iron, bronze, stone, uh, primitive, even man ape ages, man mm. ape man ages. After all, British chronicles, as well as the of those of Several other European nations trace their kings' ancestries all the way back to Japheth, Noah's son. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's so, interesting. So they're obviously going from a from a, a, a Genesis perspective. So this is from the so Institute of Creation Research. So they're going from that perspective, but they're looking at real archaeological evidence in Britain in terms of roads, and yeah, yeah. also I think they make a very interesting point about that there is an idea. You know whether you associate it with a religious idea or not. There's a very sh- strong idea in archaeology of linear progression. Stuff must get better and more complicated as it becomes more modern. But absolutely, yeah, that's an ideological perspective. It's not 
a fact. And in fact, when you actually study history, you see it's a lot more of ups and downs as as things change. Basically, um, we don't we're not just on this constant upward spiral to become something better. You know, things can go down the shitter again. <laughs> Yes, it, it it certainly feels like that today, doesn't it? In, yeah. in places, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, feels like it could. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. That was great, great, and I think that's it really, you know, brings into one of the points on on the Roman road video. They found these roads on the lidar. Do we even know they're Roman? What? And if they if there were some built between fifty AD and four ten AD. That's fine, but were they just built over the top of a previous road? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And and they can't make an assumption in until they've dug it up. Um, frankly, and it, it's a shame that we've got to destroy the evidence in order to to understand it. But you yes. know, when we when we make our claims through the British records, um, we're asked for physical evidence. Well, I think we should demand the same of of anyone with a coming from the other other perspective yeah as well. very good points yeah 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 um so that guy i was talking about is called howard crowhurst okay right and you should yeah his stuff so he's um he's like an english expat he's been living in in Brittany for for ages and he's done loads of great work on karnak um but yeah he's done a stonehenge i think it's called stonehenge new revelations on youtube i'll, I'll send you one and that was There oh, was great, great, thanks. great stuff in there. Really nice. good stuff. Um, that was something I've been watching, which I really enjoyed. Um, I've also been reading Chris Barber and um, Pickett's The Legacy of King Arthur. Are you, how are you getting on with that? Yeah, it's good. It's it's a lot. It's a lot more. Well, I mean, it's called The Legacy of King Arthur, so it's a it's about after the period a lot to do with the normans but it, it did it did sort of solve one thing for me which i was i never got why the normans were so interested in the in the british histories when they got here like ah i never really understood why, why they were so keen but then i what they outlined was this idea of when the romans came into normandy oh, sorry the romans when the normans arrived in normandy When they spread west into Brittany, they did what they did in Wales, and they intermarried with a lot of the, ham the, the families there. Yeah. And, of course, they got to know the legends of King Arthur that way. Yes. So then the Normans looking to establish themselves in this part of the world were then very keen on it. King Arthur became theirs as well. You know, it became something, yeah. something they went to. So then when they were then confronted with it again in wales it was like oh yeah but this you know this is something we've got to you know this is ours we already know this you know and and we want to make it our story like we don't want it to be your story yeah and also the idea of the threat of a a once and future king as well a king that can return you know it's I a very dangerous a, and yeah. potent idea you know Uh, it was something with Owen Glendor, you know, that was very strong for the uh, motif that came back with him as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, there's a the bit that confused me, though, about, about Glastonbury. Um, the idea being that, who was it? Was it Henry the First or Henry the Second? I can't remember. Um, Henry the Henry Second, the guy who um, dug up the... the uh, He supposedly found the skeletons in Glastonbury Abbey. Yeah. 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 So apparently Henry II said, so I don't know if this is Henry II's logic is, is flawed here or whether Barbara and Pickett's logic is flawed here. But they were saying that he'd he'd heard it from a, he'd heard about the gravesite from a bard in, in a Welsh court. Oh. And the reason then he wanted to prove that there was a a, a corpse of Arthur. Was to almost prove to the Welsh, look, your your king isn't returning. You know, look, he's dead. He's dead, wow, and he's dead man. in England, <laughs> right? You know. Wow. But, Never but thought of it like that. Yeah. If he got the idea from a Welsh bard, then the yeah. Welsh already knew that King Arthur was dead in England. 
So there's either a flaw in Barbara and Pickett's logic there, or a but, or a flaw in Henry the Second's logic. Or, I'm not sure which one it is. Or a purposefully uh, misleading. Uh, yes. Bard who, yeah. Who, I, who's who's who probably knows where King all about King Arthur and where he is. Yeah. But, um, you've got this. You've got King Henry the Second who's desperate to to do something publicly to regain his reputation. He yeah. killed Thomas Becket. He wasn't a popular guy. Yeah. You know I mean, yeah. so it's like. I would think, I uh, yeah, it makes sense that he's pretty, he's probably desperate. And he's got this guy. So oh, I know where King Arthur is. Yeah, yeah. The Welsh <laughs> know he's dead, but they keep on saying that he's coming back. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to prove where his bones are. Yeah. Interesting, man. Yeah. They, they say yeah. that the, the the bones were actually real, but they were probably of King Arvarajas. Um, but oh. which is, you know, I I sort of get where they've got to that, but it's it's yeah. a funny book because they. And I find this with other researchers working on the same topic is that they make some quite, you know, exciting claims, um, but they don't get in the stink like Wilson and Blackett do. And a lot of their claims are based on very tenuous evidence, you know. Um, yeah. Wh why is it when 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 researchers like this make make mistakes or make claims then they're 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 just wrong or mistaken and when wilson and blackett make claims like that they're they're forgers and misleading and yeah you know what what yeah. what's that about what why that double standard you know especially when so much of wilson and blackett is based on real solid research the same as which and where you can find other researchers who who support them and think it's good solid work as well you know yeah. there's there's plenty of people, like serious researchers in the field, who will, will would not say that a lot of Wilson Blackett's work is built on very solid ground. So, um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. That's yeah, they're very very good points. Absolutely, yeah. I um, like how they've they've reached um, they reached the, the the same conclusions on who Arthur was, which I really like that uh, they did it their own way. Yeah, yeah. Got to the same, got to the same, um, Arthur of Moiri. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, they start that book by saying, look, the sixth century chronology is a really big problem and we need to, people need to look at it. Yeah. You know, you know, something's gone wrong here. Um, um, and I think that's, that's great. Um, the other thing There's in the book sorts, is, isn't there? yeah. Yeah. The other, the other thing in the book is, uh, St. Ar, St. Armel. Oh, okay. Saint Armel yeah. is who they believe to be Arthrasat Myrig in retirement in Brittany. In Brittany, right? Okay. Uh, they reckon he changed his name to Armel, which is is basically Arthmile. Yes. Um, yeah. And yeah. just like just like Myrig, just like Tudrig, he he retired into the church in old age. That's that's their uh, their belief. I can't. I don't know what to do with that. I I think it's an interesting idea. Um, it's certainly a possibility. I don't see why not. Um, why it interested me is because St. Armel is recorded in Devon. Is he in Devon or in Cornwall? I think he's in Devon. As St. Erm. Now, Erm oh. is, is one of my big tinning rivers that I'm very much interested in. Right. Now, you don't often get, although I, you know, a church or a farm or something like that, I can be see named after a sixth century British saint. Can't imagine yeah, a yeah. river being named after a sixth century saint because especially quite big rivers are normally have much more ancient names that you know way older than Latin, you know, all our Brythonic names basically for rivers. Yeah. So it seems odd. Um but the other possibilities were um it's been um, recorded as the Arm or even the Aram. And Aram is a place in the Lebanon, um, which is where we get the word Aramaic from. <laughs> right. I like that. Yeah. So I thought that was a good little one for, for a river name, especially as the other obviously major river in Devon is Tamar. And, um, yes. you know, Tamar is a Hebrew word for the, for the date palm. Um, and, Literally Tamar. You don't need to mess around with it at all. The word is Tamar. Um, it's a very ancient word. Um, um, and yes. 
yeah so that that was a so armel got me sort of thinking on this um this other little little train of thought really about the river Erm because the the um the current explanations for its name are not good enough they um they say it's because there's a place nearby called Ermstock or something like that um yeah. which is um Oh, I might be stock. I've got the book in the other room. Um, stock, which is meant to be that the farm on the River Erm, and they say that that's where the river got its name from. But that doesn't. That's a circular argument. You can't say that the river got its name from the farm, which is called the farm on the River Erm. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. It doesn't work like that, does it? No. Yeah. So um, that that that's not good enough for me either. So um, yep. at the moment, yep. it's either Saint Arm. Or uh, Saint Armel, or um, or Aram, but I'm not sure. That's Brilliant. just that's one of my little mysteries at the moment. Um, another one, another one to add to the list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great stuff. Interesting. Um. Oh, there was one thing I forgot to mention on our little Cornish video as well. Was um, when I was talking about Brioch and Freoch. Yeah. Uh, the other place name we've got in Devon is Brixham, and that's that's associated with um, St Brioch as well. So, um, right. Yeah, and that, that that was actually the one that sent me on the sent me on the little rabbit hole with that one. But um, yeah, um, I've got a couple of other tangents, but if you've got something else, let me know as well. I think I'm out. I'm I'm out of steam. I'm out of. Uh... Out of uh, um, what's it? Out You've been content. working too hard, Adam. I know, mate. You haven't I been know. doing the fun stuff enough. I haven't. I haven't. I I do as much as I can when I get in, but I I no, I don't blame you. It's 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 exhausting. Let me um, could I have a share? Is that all right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Right. We're so... looking forward to the Britain's Hidden History Meetup, aren't we, Adam? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm afraid I won't be able to go, but I will be following it intently. I am absolutely super stoked to um, hear Marshall's talks on um, on her book. Very excited about that. that. Yeah. yeah. Hold on a minute. I just need to pause a second. I am still recording, honey. Yeah. All right. Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Let's get yeah. on with this. I'll just do you with this. So one thing I wanted to do um at some point was like um uh stuff other stuff on dartmoor archaeology which i was like confused about or you know didn't doesn't add up to me and i wanted to do like maybe do like a one and a half hour little presentation on it but i'm never going to be organized to do it so i think every time we have just like a casual chat i'll just do one little one or something like that and just yeah, do it yeah. All right, so this is this is Grim's Pound. This is one that always comes up as like a, you know, great site to visit on Dartmoor. You've got oh, you've got zoomed in. Let's have a look. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. oh, none of these images are good. This is a good one here. So I don't know how well you can see that, but you're looking at one of these Bronze Age enclosures that we looked at quite a few of on the mining video. But can you see the size of the wall there, Adam? I think, yeah, I, I can see. I can see a wall, yeah. You can see a wall. <laughs> That's a yeah. good start. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we can get in any closer. No. Oh, no, we're just skipping. Oh, but right, okay. um, basically, it's the, the wall at Grims, Grimsfam. The, the reason why it's quite famous and a lot of people go, is because the wall's like two to three metres thick. Um wow. Yeah, that in in some places they reckon that it was it could have been up to five meters high as well. Big chunks wow. of granite. The entrance way here, this is what we're looking at here, is absolutely fantastic. This is easily as uh, like six foot high here on either side, and you can see it's paved on the way in. So yeah, Britons did know how to pave things in the middle of Middle Bronze Age, right? Going back to roads again. Um, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic place. Um, I try. I did want to find a better picture, but never mind. You can have a look yourself. There's a few videos about Grim's Pound as well. You can find online. Um, uh, a lot of people visit there. 
Now, um, it's called Grimm's Pound. Um, the Anglo-Saxon word Grimm is meant to relate to Odin. Um, and basically, they saw yeah. it as a, a, a warrior stronghold, basically. Um, but there's problems with this. Um, it's kind of like on the side towards the bottom of a hill. So, you know, if that old logic of someone could be up on the higher ground throwing stuff over the wall quite easily, it's not a very defendable place, right? Right. That's fine with me. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. The problem I have is what they think is that it was used for as a as basically the, the animal enclosure, cattle enclosure. Um oh, right overnight um to keep the animals safe from from you know, there would have been plenty of wolves, probably bears here at the time as well. Um, you'd want to keep your animals safe. But <laughs> I haven't worked on farms a lot or anything, but I've worked with animals and I've worked with cows and I know what cows do to the ground. And if the people... So there's, there's about 20, 20 to 25 roundhouses that were in use in Gr Grimm's Pound. So let's say five people by house, let's say 100, 125 people. So you need cows for 125 people. Let's say, I don't know, I'm going to go really low and say you need, you need about 50 cows for that many people to live, yeah. right? Because these were, remember we said the, they're believed to be pastoralists, these people. They only really yeah. produce what they consume and vice versa, whatever. Now, if you keep 50 cows in a place like this overnight, right, they're going to stomp around looking for food, right? So if you've got kitchen gardens or anything like that near your roundhouses, they won't last long. <laughs> the cows will be in there and they'll bloody eat it, right? You'll need some, you need some serious fencing around that if you want to keep them going. Also, if it's raining, and, and winter is probably the time they would have been getting these things in the most. So the, the food is scarcer for, for predators, so they're more likely to go after grazing animals, you know, go after human-owned animals. Um, uh, it, it's darker, generally, so you can't keep an eye on the animals, so you bring them in, bring them in overnight. So it's more likely to be raining. If you have 50 cows in that enclosure and it's raining, in one week, that would be a mud bath. Ah, right. Yeah. It would be yeah. ruined and there'd be uh -huh. nothing for the cows to eat there. So even if your kitchen garden survived that one week and they went around eating the grass, then they wouldn't last week two. Because right. the cows would be hungry week two. So then you think, oh well, these people needed feed. Well, that means they were not being pastoralists, they were growing feed somewhere, or they were trading with someone who was growing feed, right? Right. Okay, right. so that's one problem. Problem two is that where do people who are managing their cows all the time and either growing or producing stuff to, to, to exchange for animal feed get the time to build a five-metre-high, three-metre-wide granite wall? Mm -hmm. And for what? Yeah. Right. It, okay, so let's say they were the richest cattle men around and they, they, had, they had, like, extra cows. They had more cows than there were people. They had 200 of them. So that one week of rain where your inside of your enclosure takes to get muddy now turns to 12 hours, <laughs> one night, because <laughs> you've got 200 cows in there or whatever. It yeah. would be wrecked. It would be, it's just absolutely terrible idea. I don't, I, I, not good. So problem number three is this interpretation is the same for every single other Bronze Age enclosure wall on Dartmoor, right? And I don't know if you remember from our from our video, is that oh, there a lot of these are just showing Grimm's Pound. Is that the the walls for most of these things are, are very small? You know, they they might be a meter wide, but often I see. They, they collapsed. Um, they probably had some sort of palisade or fencing around them. Um, but a lot of them haven't been dug, so we can't really prove it. Um, but that is the same interpretation given for those very small, very thin walls than is given for the five-metre-high, three-metre-wide 
balls. It just doesn't. Surely you need you need something else there to justify the scale of it. You know, you can't yes. just say, "Oh, they use this for this, and they use these for that," but they're completely different. But they're different. different. Yeah. yeah, they're completely no, different not structures. Happening. And no. and also, Grim's Pound is a pretty large enclosure with a lot of the houses inside, whereas a lot of the enclosures you get, they only have one house inside, and they're relatively small. Again, like how many cows they think people were keeping in there and what state that ground would have been in after, you know, over one winter, you know, by January it would have been bloody horrible. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, you also need a time after say the winter and the grass is growing again in spring, you're going to want your cows out of there for a couple of months. So the grass can recover. If you want them back in there in winter, if you're still getting them in every night over the spring and summer as well, yeah. There's absolutely no time for it to recover. And by the time it comes right. around to winter again, man, your mud bath is going to be a meter deep. <laughs> it's going to be awful. Uh, I, so that's one of my things where I look at our local archaeology and I go, this doesn't make sense, you know? Um, so, yeah, I've, I've, that's no. a little bit about Bronze Age Grimm's Pound. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think... Um... Yeah, it's unfair. You get two completely different um, structures being given the same label. No, yeah. It's not good. Yeah. yeah, something's, you know, something's obviously going on here that's a bit different, else there wouldn't be an absolutely massive wall with a massive entrance and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a different site and it requires a different interpretation, I think. So, yeah, and that's a... That's a good one. You can easily, if if you're not, if you don't know the area, you can have a little Google and you, you can see some nice little videos which show it a bit better than I've managed to do here. Um, so yeah, that's a good one to look at. Oh, um, brilliant. And my one final note is I want to thank I, at least one Cornish person watched the last video and they liked it. So <laughs> that's good. That's a good start. I haven't been undrawn and quartered by my neighbours to the West for doing a video about their history. So <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, not that I really understand, but I understand <laughs> that there is a, uh, a, 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 um, a kind of divide uh, over the Tamar. Yeah. <laughs> you guys throw rocks at each other, right? <laughs> but, right. But you know, I, I want I want my Cornish brothers to know that it's um that that, that boundary was invented by the Saxons yeah. in order to divide us. It wasn't you know. Let's not forget that. <laughs> that's not. That's yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Anyway, that I really enjoyed that, Adam. Yeah. No, that was great fun. Great fun. Cheers, Peter. If you ever, if you if you come up with when you when you get a bit of a break from work and you manage to get some sleep. <laughs> you do a yeah. bit of reading you just say and i'll come here and sit and listen to you blither on about something yeah yeah great i'll uh <laughs> i've got so much on my list that there's not gonna be there's not a shortage of things to do and talk about no absolutely not and uh, then like yeah it's um yeah. it's great coming on here and just having the chat that's why i do it so yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and um yeah, I think people are enjoying it, so that's good as well. <laughs> <laughs> One person from Cornwall is, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Lovely. Awesome. Right. See All you right. later, folks. Take care, guys. Thanks for watching.